Many people have the misunderstanding that liberated beings become very boring. <coughs> How many of you believe that? Yeah? <laughs> It's a very bad misunderstanding because the ego never wants to be boring. And so it always has an excuse. I don't want to waste my life sitting in that cave doing nothing. I don't want to be active. And of course, nothing is further from the truth. The more liberated we are, the more creative we are, the more empowered we are in every field that moves us. And we are moved by infinite fields of possibility, the more liberated we are. And this is shown in the history of the great spiritual traditions, and even of those outside of those traditions who have achieved self-realization. <clears throat> I was reminded recently of one of the great Zen masters in Japan, a man named Takuman Soho. He was born in 1573 during the era of the, the shogunate, the Tokugawa shogunate. And uh, he was a, a great poet, artist, calligrapher, philosopher, master of the tea ceremony, <coughs> and a philosopher, wrote a great deal. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he became very popular, and the shogun called him to the court, and that's where he's problems began. He got into politics as well. Now, this is a, an interest that we have to be very careful about. But in the court, he became um, a teacher of the great samurai warriors. And uh, they, they came to him, including Musashi, a very famous samurai, for lessons in swordsmanship. And he was able to teach them because his mind was so still that he could help to bring a swordsman into that timeless state where he could be aware of what was happening in slow motion and be able to respond with absolute accuracy. And he developed there the concept of the unfettered mind, that this was the problem that everyone had. And in those days, you know, they realized that liberation is not a luxury. It's not just something that you know, you can do with or without, especially if you're a samurai or a warrior, because your career will be very short if you haven't achieved this power. But even in, in any field of endeavor. And, uh, and so he had a number of samurai uh, students who he was teaching the art of swordsmanship to, but through the means of meditation. Uh, he was also called upon by court uh, what should we say, politicians. And uh, there were power struggles, of course, in the court. And uh, at, at one point, apparently, he sided with the losing team, and they exiled him to the far north of Japan. And uh, nothing was happening there. But he said these were his happiest days. And uh, he took up cooking, became a great chef. He loved radishes. And uh, he invented the pickled radish, the huge, the daikon, you know, and, and it's still famous. I, I haven't confirmed this, but apparently if you go to Japan today, you can order a takuanzuke. It's still named after him, this pickled daikon. Anyway, he made many uh, dishes. He was very famous as a cook. <clears throat> I'm very happy up in the north, but the losing side eventually became the winning side, and they called him back, and they wanted his help again. But this time he refused to go back into politics, so he learned his lesson from that. But while he was in exile, the um, samurai kept writing to him and asking for advice. And he wrote back letters on, on swordsmanship. And those letters have become very famous and they've been collected into books that uh, not only swordsmen, but all martial artists today still read and study for the insights into the martial arts. And I read them years ago when I was an Aikidoist and into Japanese martial arts. But this idea of the unfettered mind is a very uh, powerful concept. And th the idea is that the mind must not be detained by anything. The mind must remain forever free. It cannot be stopped. If you're a swordsman and you're thinking about the other guy's sword, your mind is stopping on that and you'll get cut because it will create fear of his sword. You mustn't be thinking about that. The mind must be in the state of emptiness. 
But this is true always, no matter what you're doing. The mind must not be detained by anything. And the thing that detains the mind most of all is the ego. The ego is a, a, a series of conventionalized thoughts that have an emotional charge. And as soon as we get caught and fixated on any one of those charges, any signifier, any self-image, any pattern, any emotion that's connected to the ego, we're lost. The mind has now become fettered, enslaved, and it orbits around this. And it can't escape. And as soon as it does that, it's going to be cut by someone's sword. The sword of karma will cut one down. And so one must remain in the state where one does not have an ego in order not to have anything that binds the pure awareness and the emergence of the full flowering of our creative potential. So the ego is a luxury we cannot afford. And yet, <clears throat> the ego is so in love with itself that it cannot let go of its own illusory existence. This is what in French is called amour propre, right? self-love. But it's not self-love necessarily in a positive sense. You can love your ego in the form of hating it. And so many people have an ego that they both love and hate. But it is, the mind is constantly obsessed with that ego. I noticed that during the last two creative writing classes, which I use as a barometer for seeing where the students are at, <clears throat> and in one of them a couple of times ago I asked, what is amazing about yourself? Everyone wrote about the false self. Not one person wrote about how amazing the real self is, which is formless and empty and not localizable in space and time, but everyone was focused on the wonderful qualities of the false self, amor propre. And that ties you, it fetters you. And then when I, in the last uh, creative writing class this week, I asked about what is it like when all the veils of illusion fall away? Well, very few veils of illusion fell away from anyone. A few, but not very many. Not enough to realize that the ego that was still observing the loss of a few veils and grieving over them had not let go of the illusion of its own reality. And that illusion, that love of that false existence even whether obsessing to be in the matrix or out of it, because there is no ego either within or without that has any reality. It keeps one obsessed and fettered to this illusion. So meditation is letting go of that illusion of the existence of a separate entity. And that entity is only an appearance in consciousness as is the whole world. And if we can let go of that obsession, the entity itself dissolves because it's only kept alive by our attention that we give to it. Let it go and there is an unfettered mind. There's freedom, liberation. And so that's what we're doing in meditation. Let go of the interest in the fettered mind which is fettered to the ego and be in the emptiness and you'll see that this freedom allows the infinite potentialities to arise that give the bliss and the beauty and the real meaning of existence through the flow of the creative power that transcends words, it transcends any localized identity and the energy of that pure love will by itself purify all the vestiges of the mind's obsessions and fixations, when it flows, allow the flow to purify the whole mind stream of those detritus signifiers of the ego. Let it go forever and be free. And then the mind will never be detained by anything. It will never be congealed into an image that then has to be defended and has to be opposed 
to some illusory other, and one avoids all of the suffering that having an ego brings about. And in place of that suffering and temporary pleasures that always result in more pain is the bliss of timeless presence. So let's give ourselves the gift of that right now.